As World War I was raging in Europe, Woodrow Wilson was going through his first term of office as President of the United States. His major focus was on making progressive reforms aimed at big businesses. And when he came up for re-election in 1916, he could brag that he had kept us out of war. We were not involved in that bloody war in Europe. But we had been involved in other things which helped keep us distracted. Over here in the United States, in our half of the world, in the Western Hemisphere, <clears throat> Wilson had been enforcing the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, intervening in a few places. But the most significant place that we intervened was in Mexico, our southern neighbor. In 1910, Mexico should have been celebrating its centennial, but instead Mexico uh, looked around, saw things weren't as they should be, and a, another revolution broke out. Eventually, the dictator Huerta um, rises to power briefly, and uh, the United States does not uh, like him. So, uh, under Wilson, we're going to end up sending uh, the United States uh, Marines to uh, land at Veracruz and take that port uh, to show that we're not pleased with him and to uh, act on behalf of some sailors who had gotten in trouble down there. But the main thing was we were flexing our muscle, letting where to know that we do not support his government. Ultimately, he is driven from Mexico, but then the Mexican Revolution uh, continues with three of the other revolutionary leaders, Carranza, uh, Zapata, and Villa, now fighting with each other to see who would become the president. Ultimately, the United States recognized Carranza as the president of Mexico when he seized power in Mexico City. And in retaliation for that, Pancho Villa, who had worked so hard uh, to try to win over American support by uh, encouraging American newspapers and even early movies to portray his actions in Mexico, um, since we didn't support him, he attacked uh, Columbus, New Mexico, robbing a bank, killing some Americans, and uh, therefore we pursued him into Mexico. Now, this was Villa's plan. He actually wanted us to pursue him because by us pursuing him into Mexico, Carranza's government can either tell the United States, no, get out, and make an enemy out of us, or he can just let us waltz right into Mexico and the people of Mexico will say, hey, why aren't you defending our national border? Either way, Villa is hoping to cause trouble for Carranza's government, enabling him to overthrow it. But this actually ends up working out well for us. We're not going to catch Villa. These are his mountains. This is his home. He grew up there. He's going to lead us on a wild goose chase through Mexico, but it actually works out good for us because John J. Pershing will be the general leading this expeditionary force, and we will be not going down there with horses and mules, but this time with trucks and automobiles and airplanes, hunting for Villa, using these modern tools of war, uh, on an expedition, and our command structure gets practice in uh, leading an army. And so this actually becomes a good warm-up for us for what eventually will become the First World War for us. But it, ultimately what ends up happening is Carranza's government uh, has to stand up to the U.S., and they end up working out a deal where they promise they will catch Via if we will just leave and we agree to that because we don't want to bring down the government. So it doesn't end up working out for Villa. He doesn't get what he wants. Ultimately, uh, he will retire, uh, make a deal with the government of Carranza, and they'll let him retire as a revolutionary hero. And shortly thereafter, he'll be assassinated by one of his enemies. But it was a good warm-up for us, and it kept us distracted. Now, over in Europe, though, the First World War is raging, and we will ultimately end up being involved. Now, the things that lead to the First World War are the isms. Nationalism, militarism, imperialism. Now, you're already familiar with imperialism. Uh, European countries were competing for possessions around the world, and that led them to conflict. Another thing that was leading them towards conflict was militarism. England was building up the most powerful uh, navy they could, and Germany was trying to catch up, and Germany was building up a big army, and France was trying to stay ahead, and everyone is building up their militaries. 
And if you spend that much money on the military, you kind of want to use, use it and get your money's worth. So they're building up their militaries. And then there's this idea of nationalism. Now, the term nationalism is a little tricky. Nationalism could mean you love your country, or it could mean you're going to destroy your country. Nationalism isn't about your country. It's about your people. Nationalism means I love my people, the people I identify with. That could be I'm a German, and I identify with other Germans who speak German and who have, tell the same fairy tales to their children as I tell to my children who have the same culture and eat the same foods. And we, even though some of us live in the Austrian Empire and some of us live in Prussia and some of us live in Bavaria and some of us live in French-controlled territories, although we're all spread out, we are a people. And what ends up happening with German nationalism in the 19th century is Prussia leads the march to start uniting the different German provinces. They fight a war with Austria and take away German provinces. They fight a war with France and take away German provinces. And eventually, Germany becomes a nation because of nationalism. It builds a nation. And the same thing happens in Italy as the different Italian provinces and city-states unite as Italy. But nationalism can destroy a nation, too. Austria. Austria was torn apart by nationalism. The Germans, some of them were wanting to be part of greater Germany. Other people in the Austrian Empire were Hungarians or Slavs, Serbs, uh, Mygars, Czechs. There were all kinds of ethnicities as part of this empire. And as these different ethnic groups start feeling a spirit of nationalism, they want their own countries. And it's going to tear apart the Austrian Empire. So nationalism is you want your people to have your own nation. You're looking out for your people. So it could build a nation, it could tear apart a nation, but that's nationalism. Well, these factors are all driving Europe towards war. Now, in Europe, they've built alliances. England and France are both nervous about uh, the growing power of Germany, and they made an alliance with Russia on the other side of Germany, so Germany would have to fight a two-front war. If they ever attacked one of them, they'd have to fight them all. Germany had made an alliance with Austria and with Italy, so all three in the middle, and eventually German si Germany's side will be called the Central Powers, although Italy itself will uh, switch sides. But it'll be ultimately the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, and finally Bulgaria, and uh, Turkey will at be added later on, the Ottomans. But the other side, we'll call them the Allies because we'll ultimately end up joining England and France. And um, Russia was on that side for a while. Well, they build alliances. And they got their guns pointed at each other. And they're just waiting for something to set it off. And the thing that sets it off is Serbian nationalism. Down there in Austria, Serbian nationalists assassinated the uh, heir to the throne, Archduke Ferdinand. So Austria is mad at the little country. Now, there, there was a country of Serbia that had won its independence from the Ottomans, but there were Serbs living uh, north of there in Austria, and the Serbs were trying to unite themselves together and have their own country. So the nation of Austria, the Austrian Empire, is mad at the country of Serbia because they are to blame for per preparing the terrorists that came into their country and killed their heir to the throne. So Austria declares war on Serbia, not part of the alliances. But the Serbians are related to the Slavs, related to the Russians, and um, the Russians end up siding with Serbia, and they declare war on Austria. Now the alliances kick in. Because Russia and Austria are at war, Germany, Austria's ally, declares war on Russia, which then means France declares war on Germany, and eventually Britain will come into this war as well, living up to their alliance. And like I said, Italy will be sneaky, and they'll wait and see who they think is going to win, and then they'll join the Allies. So very quickly, war explodes. And to make a long story short, in Europe, they're all fairly evenly matched. Um, Germany and Russia on the eastern front, they fight, 
The Germans push the Russians back a ways, but they can't overrun all of Russia. And the Russians aren't strong enough to push the Germans back, and so it becomes a stalemate. Over on the Western Front, the Germans invade um, France, and they do it by going north of the border with France into uh, Belgium, which was trying to be a neutral nation. And they outflank the French. They overrun Belgium. We'll talk more about that in a second. And uh, they drive the French and the English forces back, but they can't overrun France fully. And the English and the French stop them, and it becomes a stalemate. And so all across Europe, on the Eastern Front and the Western Front, neither army can finish the job. And they make attacks and counterattacks and new weapons like machine guns and eventually poisonous gas and tanks and airplanes are all making this war much more bloody than it had ever been before. But the tactics are still old-fashioned. Hop out of your trench, run at the enemy, and try to overwhelm them. And the guy sits there and guns them down with a machine gun. So it's turning into an awful bloody war that Americans are glad we're not part of. Well... Eventually, some things are going to lead Americans to enter this war. First of all, we're, we're very tight with Britain. We speak the same language. We came from Great Britain. Our nation did. And so we have a natural affinity for Britain. On top of that, because we're reading British newspapers and getting information mostly from Britain, we're receiving Allied propaganda telling us just how bad the Germans are and just how good the Allies are. Now, if you listen to all I told you about how the war began, honestly, was anybody the good guy here? Anybody the bad guy? Everybody pretty much was to blame for it. World War I is unlike World War II. World War II, you have the Nazis, and they're evil, and they're committing genocide. World War I, everybody's kind of to blame. But over here in America, because we're getting it filtered through British eyes, the British are the good guys, the Germans are evil. And so the United States is starting to get that general opinion. Now, on top of that, the Germans are going to do some things which are going to help build that reputation. Germany was no match for Britain on the high seas. The British fleet still reigned supreme. But the Germans had this new weapon, submarines. And what they started to do is use their submarines, which could hide beneath the waves, to attack British shipping. And one of the German submarines attacked not a British cargo ship, but attacked a British passenger liner called the Lusitania, which was coming from America, and there were Americans on board. Now, when the Lusitania was sunk, we were furious. They had killed civilians, and that was not a military target. The truth of the matter was, it was a military target. The Lusitania exploded because it was full of ammunition that was being smuggled. But uh, the American newspapers didn't say that. They just talked about how evil the Germans were for sinking men, women, and children that were civilians on board this thing. And Germany actually apologized for doing it, but the damage was done. We're starting to think Germany's not so nice. And it just gets worse. Germany's afraid we might be about to help the Allies, and they want to keep that from happening. So the Germans sent a little note to Mexico who we were having some issues with, and they said, hey, Mexico, if you guys will attack the United States and start a war, when we finish winning the war in Europe, we'll come to America and help you get back all that land America took from you. You know, Texas, California, all that. Well, the Mexicans didn't get the note. The British intercepted it, and they handed it to us. And now we know Germany's trying to start a war between us and Mexico. Well, at this point, we're kind of ticked. And so the United States finally decides we must enter this war. And it was a good thing we entered at the time we did. See, things weren't going so well in Russia. And out there in Russia, because the Tsar was losing, the, he was not doing well in this war, and the Russian people didn't like the Tsar that much anyway, to begin with, he didn't give them a lot of rights and freedoms, and there were a lot of different revolutionary groups that wanted to get rid of the Tsar. Well, with him so unpopular, it didn't take a lot for a group called the Bolsheviks, communists, one of many revolutionary groups that wanted to get rid of this czar, uh, they started a revolution. And the czar was uh, defeated and captured. 
and eventually executed. And the Bolsheviks, well, they're going to have to fight a war with other Russians who don't want to be communist, and Russia is going to plunge into civil war. And the Bolshevik government does not want to fight Germany and their enemies in Russia, so they made peace with Germany, which meant all those German troops that are over here on the Eastern Front can now go over to the Western Front and overwhelm and the French and the English and finish the war. And this happens right in 1917, right as we're entering the war. So fortunately for the Allies, when Russia drops out, we enter the war and we're going to reinforce them. Now, as the United States gears up for war, we're going to, first of all, have to prepare ourselves to fight. And so we are going to begin drafting soldiers. We have a couple of million men already go off and sign up, but we need more. So we will institute the draft for the first time since the Civil War, and we will draft another three million men. We're going to have to prepare our industrial complex to fight this war as well. So the um, United States government is going to uh, organize the War Powers Board that can kind of tell production uh, what they need to produce. We need tanks. We need planes. We need guns. Uh, we need you to stop making Ford automobiles and make these military trucks. And so we start uh, kind of managing our, our businesses to help them produce what we need for the war. We're also going to institute uh, some rationing. Now, we'll see this on a bigger scale during World War II, but we're going to have what are called meatless Mondays, wheatless Wednesdays. We're going to encourage people to grow victory gardens, and we'll see all this again in World War II, but people are going to ration so that we'll have the food that we need to go uh, feed our troops. And uh, the <clears throat> National War Labor Policies Board is going to be there to prevent strikes. If labor's saying they're not getting mistreated, they're not being paid or treated well, the government's going to come in and negotiate on their behalf. Uh, that, because we don't want them going on strike, and we won't, don't want the big businesses taking advantage of workers because there's a war on and they can do what they want to to them. So it'll be there to keep business functioning, moving forward, producing what we need. And we're going to see women very involved. Women are going to be part of the uh, Red Cross as nurses. Women are going to go uh, both here and overseas as reporters. We're going to see women taking some roles in the factories. We'll see it on a much larger scale in World War II. But women are filling jobs. They're even helping out as secretaries in the military, uh, allowing us to free more men to fight on the battlefield. So women are playing a role as well. And one of the big shifts in America happens during this time, the Great Migration. African Americans had mostly stayed in the South after the Civil War. But during World War I, there's a need for more workers as we send so many men off to fight. And these African Americans that are living in the South, segregated, and many of them stuck in this job as sharecroppers, where they have no opportunity to really leave this position, um, northern businesses would come down South and pass out railroad tickets to the uh, sharecroppers and say, hey, hop a train, flee this, uh, this situation, and come get a job in the North. And thousands did. And so from this point on, you see this major shift of African Americans moving to northern cities. Now, another group that's also shifting at this time, Mexico had some pushes and pulls going on. There were pushes. There was a revolution and unrest in Mexico, so some Mexicans came across the border. Other Mexicans had always been coming across the border looking for work, uh, harvesting crops here in America. But now with a war on, down south, people were leaving the farms to go uh, up north and work in the factories. And Mexican workers could migrate to the eastern part of the southern United States and fill some of those jobs. Some of them could migrate directly to the factories of the north. And so you had uh, a large uh, number of Mexicans coming to the United States, filling jobs, and uh, that was also a shift in our population. Now, as the fighting begins for the United States, we send our troops to France just in the nick of time. John J. Pershing will be our commanding general. The French and the English think that since we're really inexperienced, they ought to break our army up and put a few Americans under British control here and a few Americans under French control. And we say, uh-uh, we're the United States Army. We fight as a unit, 
Now, you tell us where you want us, but we are fighting as an army, and they have no option. They just got to let us do that. And that means that we will be the target of the Germans when they make attacks because we're raw, we're inexperienced. And we'll have to learn the hard way with some casualties how to do the job, but we have a very quick learning curve. Now, the Germans really badly need to win this war quickly. Uh, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk has allowed uh, them to send troops from Russia to the Western Front here in France. And so they make a huge push in June to try to overwhelm uh, our forces and break through and win the war before we can get enough Americans over here to switch the balance of power. But uh, American forces uh, managed to help stop the German advance at Belau Wood. One of the heroes of this part of the war is uh, a fellow by the name of Alvin York. He's a hillbilly from Tennessee who was, uh, because he had become a Christian, initially he was against fighting because he was a young Christian. He really didn't fully have all the theology behind him, and he believed simply the Bible said, Thou shalt not kill, so I'm a conscientious objector. I'll serve, but I won't fight. But when he went to basic training, he was good with a gun. They made him, put him in charge of training other people to be good with a gun. And eventually a, uh, one of the officers who was Christian explained to him, said, look, you know, when the Bible says thou shalt not kill, it doesn't mean you shouldn't defend people uh, and defend your country. It's just talking don't murder and things like that. And, well, he ends up talking um, Alvin York into eventually uh, fighting in the war. And uh, when Alvin York goes over there to France, his unit gets pinned down under a German machine gun nest, and they kill the officers. And he's now, as a sergeant, he's the highest ranking guy. And he, so he just tells everybody else, all right, just stay here. Lay down. Don't get shot. And he crawls over where he can see the Germans, and he puts a bullet through one of them. And the next German sticks his head at that machine gun nest to see what's going on. He puts a bullet through him. And pretty soon, the Germans in the machine gun nest realize they're the ones pinned down. They're trapped. And he saves his unit makes the Germans surrender, uh, eventually captures more Germans on the way back to their lines, and becomes the most decorated war hero in America. And his story is a really interesting, good story. They eventually made a movie about it. So he's one of our big war heroes. Now, after we stop Germany's last big advance, in September, the Allies make their big attempt to break through. And the Americans are also a big part of this. One of our units of troops broke through the German lines, and then the Germans closed behind them and trapped them. And we didn't know they were still alive. We figured they'd been wiped out. And so we were shelling the German positions, and we were bombing our guys who were surrounded by Germans. And they sent a message by this little carrier pigeon, Cherami. And Cherami delivers the message. By the time Cherami makes it across the battlefield, Cherami has lost a leg, fortunately not the one the message was tied to. Cherami's lost an eye, breastbone's been shattered, but the little wounded pigeon comes flying in with the message, and it saves our guys. We stop bombing them, we break through, we save them. And uh, you can see this war hero, uh, which has been stuffed and mounted and is in the Smithsonian Institute. And by November of 1915, we finally are entering Germany. And at this point... Kaiser Wilhelm abdicates the throne. People are ang angry with him. There's revolution in the streets. And Germany uh, forms a new government, the Weimar Republic. And uh, they sue for peace. And so an armistice, a ceasefire, is declared on November 11th. And then negotiations begin for the treaty to end the war. Now, Wilson, as our president, when we entered the war... He wanted to make this the war to end all wars. He wanted this to be a continuation of progressivism. And so he came up with an idea, a list of 14 things that if we do these things, there'll never be another war again. And you know what? If we did those things, there would never be another war again. But when you look at the very first one, you know <laughs> this is a pipe dream. His number one first thing on his list is no more secret treaties. How are you going to know someone did a secret treaty if it's a secret? So you know this is kind of uh, just a dream. It's not really going to happen. But a lot of his ideas are practical. He suggests several things. And they're aimed at the isms. He suggests that uh, there be freedom of the seas. He's attacking imperialism. No more cutting up the world into your region and my region. 
No economic trade barriers. Again, the same thing. He wants arms limitations to stop militarism. He wants uh, the recognition of colonial peoples. He's starting to undo imperialism. The United States, which had gone through our little phase of outright imperialism, is now leading the way and encouraging ending imperialism globally. Now, I summed up 6 through 13 as self-determination for the peoples of Europe. This is nationalism. We're going to try to redraw the map of Europe where every group of people gets their own country. Um, the problem is England and France and Italy and the allied winners over there, they wanted a reward for winning the war. They wanted territory. And even more, France really wanted to put limitations because they were still scared to death of Germany. France wants all kinds of limitations on Germany. And we end up, instead of drawing this thing equitably uh, to fulfill nationalistic needs, there are some... Uh, some of the lines that we draw are going to create problems later on, as we're going to see in World War II. Now, finally, his last idea is to create an organization to settle all disputes, the League of Nations. It's kind of an early version of the UN. And the idea is if there's ever dispute again, instead of fighting over it, we bring it to this world organization, the UN, and they'll decide who's right and who's wrong, and we won't have to shoot each other. However... After personally going to France, only president to ever do this, he goes overseas, he's his own negotiator, he goes to France, he's at the meetings, he negotiates. He doesn't quite get everything that he wants because the Europeans are bent on winning the war, not having a war with no winners as he's wanting to do. But he gets most of his ideas through. He comes back to America and he wants us to ratify the treaty. But the United States never ratified the treaty. The Republicans controlled Congress, and they were concerned that his League of Nations would kind of subjugate the United States to a world organization. They wanted some uh, limits put on this treaty, which he wasn't willing to put in place. He's not willing to negotiate, and so he runs around the country uh, traveling, giving speeches, encouraging people to put pressure on their congressmen to vote for his treaty, and he gives himself a stroke. And the Republicans voted no on the treaty, and the United States never joined the League of Nations. One of the most powerful up-and-coming countries isn't part of it. So right away, it began very weak. Wilson will uh, serve out his last few months an invalid in bed, leading some people to say that his wife was really our first female president, possibly signing some of the papers that he was supposed to sign for him. But uh, this was the end of this age of progressivism. World War I, in many people's opinion, was the capstone to progressivism, the war to end all wars, which we know it didn't turn out that way. But now Americans, well, they've worked hard for a couple of decades now, fixing all the world's problems and making progress and even ending war. Now it's time to enjoy ourselves. It's time for a great big party. And so as we roll on into the 1920s, America's going to shift gears. And instead of being progressive, we're going to be party-minded. We're going to enjoy the fruits of capitalism and the fruits of our hard labor. But of course, um, any big party, you're going to have booze. But oddly enough, that was one of the last progressive reforms we got through before the 1920s, is we banned it, which is going to create a whole other problem as America enters its party decade. So we'll be looking at that next.